Thank you guys so much for, for coming tonight um, on this beautiful sunny day up and on here. Uh, my name is Kara Rumble and I'm the programming manager at the Sequoia Regional Library System. So I help organize um, events for um, system-wide for our library system in Cherokee, Pickens and Gilmer counties. And um, this is our first event of our Grow with, Google's, Grow with Google series. Um, we'll have two more events um, in this in the month of April that I will share about in a little bit. But today I want to focus on our awesome local entrepreneurs who've um, so graciously given their time to share their experience and um, answer some questions today um, from the library and from people who are in attendance today. Um, so I want to give us get a chance for um, everyone to introduce themselves. So I'm just going to start with um, Cindy, you're the first one on my screen. So if you'll go first and um, we'll just go down the line. Hey, um, I'm Cindy Elliott and I'm the owner operator of Jack's Coffee Company in Jasper. Um, we've been open for seven months. I've been at it for almost a year and um, that's about it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I've been by Jack's recently and it was, um, I grew up in Jasper, so it's nice to see something like that there. Um, Sabrina, you're next on my screen, so if you'll go ahead. Hi guys, I'm Sabrina. Um, I am the owner of Bizarre Coffee in downtown Canton. Uh, I launched the company in June. We started at local farmers markets and we now have our first brick and mortar. We've been open for a little over four months and we love every second of it. Awesome. Okay, uh, Jenna, I have you next on my screen. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Jenna Schreiber. I'm chef owner of 61 Main in downtown Jasper. We are considered a farm to table restaurant and we have been in business. We will actually be going into our 13th year. So we are, <laughs> we've been around for a minute and uh, thank you for having me. I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, just a small thing. I had my rehearsal dinner um, for my wedding at 61 Main, and I can vouch that their food is absolutely delicious and wonderful. And when I go visit Jasper to visit my family, it's definitely a, a must on the list. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Samantha, let's hear from you next. I don't know if Samantha's frozen or not. Let's see, Samantha, can you hear me? Hmm. Okay, we'll move to Anna. Anna, how about you go next? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, I'm Anna Barbier. I'm the owner operator of the Woodstock Flower Company. We're um, a flower truck and then also full wedding floral services based in downtown Woodstock. And this is our, I think, fourth year, third or fourth year. Awesome. I believe that is everyone. Um, I want to give Samantha a chance to introduce herself so she can get back on, but um, that is everyone we have here today. Um, so now we have our introductions underneath our belt. Just um, some housekeeping. Um, we will be doing our pre-loaded questions first, and then we'll be opening up for a Q&A from anyone in attendance. Oh, I think I got Samantha in, one second. Make sure I don't cut her. Samantha, do we have you now? Yes. Can okay, I want you to be able to introduce yourself. <laughs> Okay, great. My name is Samantha Dickey, and I'm the founder of Dirty Beauty Cosmetics Labs, and uh, we manufacture cosmetics, and we operate out of MADE um, in downtown Woodstock. Um, we started at Woodstock Farmers Market, and I'm um, glad to be here, and thanks for having us today. Thank you. Yay, I'm glad we were able to get your introduction in. So <laughs> we're going to do our preloaded questions first, and then we'll dive into um, any questions that we may have from attendees, if we have any. And, um, and then we'll have some time that if the entrepreneur, if you as entrepreneurs have any 
um, little plugs that you want to plug in before we close today? Anything that's really cool and upcoming that you want to make sure everyone knows about? I want to make sure we get those in as well. Um, let's go off to our first question. We're going to do three minutes per question just so we can make sure we move things along. Um, so when I once I tell you the question, anyone on the panel that wants to jump in and go ahead and start the convo, um, that's where I will start our handy dandy timer. Okay, so our first question is, how did the idea for your business come about? I'll start. Um, the idea for Bizarre Coffee happened pretty naturally, I would say. Um, I've worked in coffee roasting in the back end, and I've also done digital marketing as well as I'm a self-taught artist. So after kind of juggling all of these things that I love to do so much, um, I knew that there was a need to somehow mesh them some way together into something that I could launch myself. Um, the one night I was working with a client and I was working super late night and this idea of being extraordinary and out of the ordinary came to my head and the word bizarre jumped out and I jumped at the opportunity to make that the foundation for the business. So I incorporated my art with this idea of wanting to be in coffee and bizarre coffee came to life. Um, I'll jump in. Um, so many, many years ago, um, I was working for a family, a private chef, and they had a farm. And so we started basically eating more seasonal just because they wanted me to go out into the garden and pick what was out there. And that's what I would basically cook our, our meals out of. And as time went on, I thought, well, this is kind of crazy that we've not really delved into this too much in, in different areas. And I thought, well, you know what, if this is, this is probably what's going to be up and coming. So it just seemed like the obvious thing to do when, um, when getting into an area like Jasper, that is, that's so ag agriculturally rich. So we just decided to kind of base things off of that and went from there. And any other birthing idea, birthing stories? <laughs> yeah, I have a, um, a, a, you know, just one or two things that kind of helped us launch. And um, one of them is that my grandparents are, um, were farmers. And so when I heard the term natural skincare, I was very intrigued that the same ingredients that my grandparents grew on their farms are the very same ingredients in natural skincare. So that's one of the things that really, you know, launched us and got us going in, in, in the natural um, world. And the other thing is I'm, I'm uh, a scientist and um, I have experience in, in lab science and engineering. And I love the whole STEM aspect that surrounds cosmetics. And one of the things that we do um, is um, encourage teens to pursue STEM. So that kind of um, bond between um, science and, um, you know, nature kind of um, help launch our, our brand. That's awesome. Well, let's move on to our next question. So you're just right at that three minute mark. Um, so our next question is, um, I think this is a big question for a lot of people who are interested in entrepreneurship is how did you raise funding um, for, for your venture if you did that? Um, I'll jump in on this one. That was the biggest struggle for us, for sure. Uh, not knowing where to look or how to look, how to, how to secure something that isn't going to hurt us 
payment wise and, you know, just get our feet on the ground. So uh, my husband and I we submitted finances from ourselves, of course, which I'm sure everyone has. Um, but I also went with a traditional SBA. Um, opening during COVID is risky to begin with, but there are some perks with the SBA. So uh, we got financing through a traditional SBA um, under the CARES Act 1. Um, we were looking at expanding and because now is there's a, a CARES Act 2 also. So it kind of gave us a little bit of flexibility. Um, CARES Act covers your payments for several months in the beginning. So that kind of was more of a, a safety net to know that I could open the doors and have a little more backup, you know, especially during COVID. Um, I guess I'll get into this. Uh, so when I looked into starting this, it was very, uh, my family was very instrumental in getting us going, whether it was just through labor and helping us get the restaurant ready. Uh, we did a really quick turnaround. We purchased an already existing establishment and did a transformation uh, with basically friends and family in a weekend's time and reopened within like four days of from when the original establishment shut down and we completely transformed. We painted, we reupholstered. I mean, we just utilized all the resources that surrounded us as far as that's concerned because we really had, I, I mean, I had nothing going in. <laughs> if anything, I was in the negative. Um, so from that aspect, I got just extremely lucky. And also we did do a, a, a small loan and in which I couldn't even secure on my own at that point. I mean, just that I really didn't have anything, anything behind me. So again, family stepped in. We did a small thing where um, kind of some really small private financing that we paid off as we went, just small investors, very, very small. Um, nobody that had any sort of input, just, hey, I, I believe in what you're gonna do and, and I believe you'll pay me back. And thank God we were able to do all of that. I mean, there's, I could never repay the debt to my family, uh, but that's besides the point we've now, you know, we, we've crossed into a new era. And of course the last year has been interesting for everybody. It's like starting from scratch almost in a way. Uh, but sometimes that's a good thing. So we're looking at all the positive, but that was, that was how things started way back when. Any other thoughts on raising funding? For us, we were totally self-funded. So we, we tried to start in a way that was not going to cause a lot of overhead. Um, with our idea, you know, flower trucks are a thing already. And so it's a pretty low overhead. We found the truck cheap and we said, okay, if we could barter for the, the paint job on it to make it look newer. And, um, you know, so we just took those small steps to say like, okay, we know we don't have a whole lot of overhead. or We, we don't want overhead and we don't have a whole lot of funding. So how can we make this, um, you know, uh, there's no risk, there's no risk-free scenario, but how can we have the least amount of risk moving into this and the least option for moving into debt. So um, for us, that's that was a great way to, to start. Of course, things have changed since then, but just getting started, that was really helpful. That's cool. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing your funding um, experiences. <laughs> um, let's move on to our next question. Um, how do you build this is probably a really, this is a really big question, but how do you build a successful customer base? What are some things that you've done that have kept people coming back to you? Consistent product, I would say. Uh, you know, going with something and sticking with it, uh, not, not changing things on a daily basis as far as the, the the things that need to stay consistent, whether in a restaurant, it's your service staff, um, just the quality of your product and pricing. I mean, we we kind of just went in and started and didn't even look at making changes until years, until we were years in. So I, I think honestly, uh, just consistency and, and follow following through with customers. You know, people just, people want you to be, real with what you're doing and um so consistency is a good word i think 
We have heavily focused on customer service. Um, I think that anyone who works with me understands that, especially those of us in the restaurant business, you're not going to get it right every time. You're just not. It's not. Um, mistakes are going to be made. And it's how we handle those mistakes and how we present ourselves to the public and consistently excellent customer service. Because things are going to go wrong. Things are always going to go wrong. There's no way we can avoid that. It. It's a matter of how we handle it when they do. And that is one of my big, I think my staff will tell you, that's one of my big, is that, you know, hello, how are you? Have a great day. How can we make it right? You know, all those things. So it keeps people coming back. Um, I would, I'm going to chime in. I would say a big way we built our beginning customer base was definitely events. Um, we start at the farmer's market. I worked in food and bed for a long time as server bartender all through college and after. And luckily I was able to know a couple owners of breweries and we started popping up at breweries. And honestly, anywhere somebody would let us pop up, we would pop up and hand out coffee samples. I mean, there's nothing worse than seeing somebody with a cold beer and you're there with a hot cup of coffee, but like, <laughs> if you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, and just showing up all over was really awesome for us. I mean, from people in events in Atlanta, I still ship coffee to Atlanta. I still ship coffee all over Canton, even though we're there. Um, and that's been really great. And then also customer service as well, just like she said. I mean, we definitely focus on over the top, extraordinary um, customer service every time. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for sharing that. Um, let's move on to our next question. Um, how do you market your business and which tactics have been most successful? And I think this is a big question. I mean, we're, all of us are in front of a screen, you know, for a portion of our day. Most of us can say that. So what have been ways you've marketed your business that have worked well for you? In my experience, social media has been huge. Um, so many of the, like people live on their phones and I think it's really important to show up in a way that is appealing and draws them in from a post or a video and they can see it often and consistently. So we definitely try to post on Instagram, on TikTok, on Facebook at least five times a week and show them what we're working on, um, remind them of our, our product offerings and just keep showing up in their feed. Yeah, for us, we're, we're really definitely word of mouth. The flower truck popped up at Reformation. So we would go where the people were and in Woodstock that's Reformation um, and then Reformation Brewery. And then uh, for weddings, we really believe in making friends with vendors. So your fellow vendors are gonna be the people who market for you. And so whoever that would be in your sphere, um, whoever your, your co-vendors are, you know, um, making friends with them and being a team player and doing everything you can to, um, to truly be friends with them because most of them have become some of our very close friends. Um, I have a newborn baby and my husband's putting him down to bed. So that's why I've been moving around. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's been a big thing for us is just making sure that we're, we're um, helping the people around us who are also working alongside of us, whether it's at an event or weddings or, or whatever it is. Um, the bartenders at Reformation Brewery, they've also become some of our close friends. So for, for us, it's word of mouth for sure. I can share something that did not work if anyone's interested. Um, <laughs> In the beginning, I took all the different avenues, um, social media, uh, online, email, text message, and in print. So newspaper, coupons and ads. Um, that did not work. I track all of them with coupon codes and I track all of them, I'm a data-driven person. So I track all of the response from all the different avenues and print just, you could have guessed it, but it was worth, it was cheap and it was worth a shot. And it definitely is not the way 
to do it these days. I mean, I just did not, usually on a direct mailer and newspapers and magazines are considered direct mailer, you want a one to 3% return. And I just think that's an outdated number. You know, at, at this point, plus with COVID, that becomes a really outdated number. And it's, I found it not to be true. So, you know, we didn't stick with that for very long. But social media, that's our number one. We post at least once a day on Instagram and Facebook, um, hashtag the heck out of it. And, um, you know, we're running a giveaway right now because we just got a certain number of followers. And so we try to stay really engaged through social media. Awesome. Uh, I think it's cool how, you know, we are kind of in this, you know, kind of a digital world now, but, you know, like Anna was saying, the, the word of mouth thing is still a really powerful thing. I mean, you hear that from a close friend, you know, you're going to, you're going to check that out. And uh, I could definitely say that for local businesses um, in our three counties, Cherokee, Pickens, and Gilmer, the I would say that that word of mouth is still a very powerful tool as well. Um, but with that being said, um, let's move on to our our next question. Um, so entrepreneurship can be, you know, a heavy, heavy job. So, you know, how many hours would you say that you work in a day on average um, with your business? Are we all laughing? No. <laughs> Uh, I would say the first year, uh, <laughs> I think I slept four hours a night, maybe How many hours? at least for a solid year. I don't think I got more than four hours of sleep a night. That's not a joke. <laughs> and that's, that was six days a week for sure. Um, we're, we've been around for a little while, so that's transformed for me and I've, been, but but it's it, you don't stop you always think about it so even if your actual physical hours cut back through the years uh, you want to touch everything you want to be a part of everything I mean if if you don't it may not be the right business for you I mean that's just that's my opinion on it I, I love my business and I, I want to be a part of every little nook and cranny so it's hard. I mean, you do have to detach yourself so that you can survive. <laughs> but uh, but in the beginning, I think it's a it's a huge huge commitment for sure. I definitely um, I'm glad to hear that there is somewhat of an end in sight in terms of not <laughs> sleeping. You know. <laughs> Um, currently right now, if I'm being really honest, our shop is open six days a week. So obviously either I or my husband are there. If I am not present in shop, I am on my computer. Um, that continues when I get home for many hours, not including grocery trips. <laughs> mm -hmm. If we add an amount of hours for that and keeping milk in stock, I'm sure uh, you understand me. Uh, it's Awful. a challenge. So I would say easily 12, 14 hours a day on an easy day. And sleep is sometimes non-existent there, depending how stressful the day was. <laughs> but apparently via Jenna, we have, you know, an end in sight. There is. <laughs> there is, I guess. <laughs> well, and I agree with uh, both of them. I did. It's even when I'm not there, I'm there. You know, checking numbers all day long. I mean, I think um, I think Sabrina can feel me. It's a co the coffee business is early, early morning, and it doesn't end until the sun forces you to fall asleep at some. You know, and I have kids, and you know, other things have to happen. Um, I would like to think there's an end to that in sight, but I will be honest, the idea of letting some of it go is also terrifying. So if I, and I put my heart and soul and my life and every other part of my life on hold for these 120 hour weeks or whatever they are, um, that there's a, there's a flip side to that too. So like, which part of it do I let go and let someone else handle? So, 
And I think about that too. Like, yes, I can step back. My staff actually sent me home today. My staff sent me home. They said, you have to leave. You have to go home. Falling asleep at my desk in the office. Um, so I actually got a nap today. It's like a miracle. <laughs> and I got up because I was like, what's happening? So, you know, hopefully it will back off someday. That's what I hope. <laughs> Yeah, um, my work, a lot of my work is behind the scenes. Um, I, I'm in manufacturing. So um, my day looks a little different and it varies from, from week to week. So um, sometimes I'm in the lab um, at two in the morning, literally, um, depending on what I have to ship out. And um, sometimes I'm there Thursday through Sunday, almost not nonstop. And um, sometimes um, Monday through Thursday, um, I, I don't have to do much um, depending on um, if I'm waiting for, um, you know, items that we've procured to come in. So um, I have a different, you know, a different kind of work schedule. And I, I personally like the flexibility. And um, I like the idea of, of being able to work at times that I'm most productive. Um, I don't necessarily have, um, a, you know, a, a very good um, productivity from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Sometimes my productivity is 4 a.m. to 2 p.m. And so um, I do enjoy that flexibility um, and uh, I do my best to um, you know, schedule myself um, to work in ways that I can um, you know, provide the most energy and attention to what I'm doing at the time. And I'll just, before we move on, I'll just say one thing to that. That I think seasonal work or working for yourself when there's not like, you know, a steady stream, you're not sure when the next order will come in or whatever it looks like. Yeah, there's, there's seasons of um, you just, you sleep a couple hours, you get up, you do it the same day, you know, same thing the next day. Um, but for me, it's been when I have those days that are like consistent days, I know what to expect for a couple of days in a row, blocking out times that, that um, I can fill in with something that really gives me life, like making sure I do whatever I enjoy doing. If it's running or like going to the gym or um, playing tennis with friends, it's, I try to schedule those times in. And because we work for ourselves, that might mean we work an extra hour later in the evening, but that gives me the flexibility and the, um, it's just life-giving to have that break. And so I think considering that part of my work has been um, a very healthy step for me in the past couple of years. I love those perspectives on being able to always put in that time and when you need to, but also making sure that you're taking care of yourself and so that you can put in that time on, on the other end. So um, let's move on to our next question. Um, what, well, I, I guess I'll reword this question. What is a typical day? And I feel like we kind of touched on this already, but if there's any added thoughts here, what does a typical day look like for you as an entrepreneur? And just real quick, I'm going to take a pause and just be right back. So y'all carry on. I can't wait to hear what y'all's days are like. I don't think there is a typical day for me. I mean, I still get up at the same time. I get up at 3.45 every morning and I go and I get milk or whatever I need to do and, you know, make sure everything's running. But I think part of the interest for me is that every day is completely different. You never know who's going to ask us to cater something. I never know who's going to come in and, you know, offer an opportunity. And I never know really, some of them are bad unknowns and some of them are good unknowns. You know, I could wake up in the morning to a quit, which happened two days ago. And then your day is different. You know, all of a sudden we're hiring. And I think the, having your hand in so many different things during the day, I think for some people could be, stressful to not have that consistency, to not have that nor what a normal day is. But I, I thrive on it. It's a new challenge. Every single day I wake up, there's going to be a new challenge. And I know there is. And I, and I like to face those. And those are what keep me going. Um, and that's a, it's a typical day. I really don't think there has a year. Yeah. Even after all these years, there's nothing typical about any day except for showing up I guess <laughs> Show, being being present and even if even on the days where you aren't uh, present in body you are still available all the time um, 
but for me, it's different because I have to, I'm in the kitchen as well as, uh, you know, involved in, in day-to-day operations. So when I'm in the kitchen, uh, the difference for me would be that I, I actually have kitchen deadlines because of opening times and things like that. So, um, for me, you know, the typical day is just meeting deadlines. And then (laughs) as the day winds down, you're meeting, you know, you, you start with opening deadlines and then your closing deadline. I mean, everything's, everything's around ordering times. You have to, it's, it's really just around deadlines and watching the clock, wishing you had more time is, (laughs) it's kind of my, my outlook on that is that there's not enough hours in the day. So. Okay, well, we will move on. I know we kind of touched on that with the previous question, so we'll move on to our next one. Um, how do you generate ideas? So what's kind of that process for you as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I like to um, really listen to what people are asking for. Um, as I stated before, one of the things that really helped us in the beginning was working at farmer's markets. And um, folks at farmer's markets have lots of ideas on things that they like. And so I get a lot of ideas just from, from talking to people and, and asking them, you know, what, what, what do you think you lack or what do you need? And then I try to address that, um, you know, with, with my thinking process. So it's, it's really from people. I, I love this question a lot. Um, as the natural born creative, it's really something that like I find a lot of joy in this part of being an entrepreneur. Um, and for me, the process looks almost the same every time. And it typically happens through exercise, which um, I am a runner. I've run long distances. So when I was first launching my company, I was training for a 50 mile run in which I was training very long periods of time alone. And that alone time through monotonous movement, so to speak of hiking and running, I would just spark. So I would say 30% of my run times, I would be calling my husband, like, we've got to do this, 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 this. And I just allow that kind of free natural flow get out the information or write it down or share it with somebody so that it stays on the mind and then revisit it after the run. But I typically find that like good ideas and natural born innovation for me happens through movement. And that's kind of been my process and being alone. It's very hard to like listen to that inner voice when you're, when there's too much going on which as entrepreneurs, I'm sure I'll you guys know, that can be very often. So even that walk around the block, something is, and I can always tell if I haven't felt that, it's because I haven't dedicated time to do so. I'd say shower and driving. <laughs> I guess that goes back to your alone time. I mean, my, my, my creative ideas as far as cooking is concerned a lot of times is honestly in in the car because I can focus and in the car in the shower thinking about even if it comes to the business aspect of it you you know you're thinking about conversations conversations you have throughout the day maybe with employees or uh, you know just other staff or customers Um, you know it just it comes from all over Um, and just listening and keeping your, you know, being aware of what's going on around you. That's awesome. I was, I liked what, um, I liked what uh, Samantha had to say about um, people, uh, cause that's very much the library space is us responding to community need. And uh, so I definitely, I loved all of what y'all said, but I definitely really connected to responding to um, people and what they want. So um, let's see, oh, that's the timer. Let me move on to our next question. Um, 
how do you define success for yourself personally? These are such tough questions. I think it's changed. I think what I thought I would define as success a year ago, or even, you know, I've always wanted to do this. So even 15 years ago, 20 years ago, um, has changed. I thought success would mean I could walk away and it would generate business and continue on without me. But like we said earlier, I'm not sure that's really what I want. You know, I don't know that I will ever retire, quite honestly, fully. You know, what is success? I mean, we can all, we all want to pay our bills. We want to pay our overhead, we want to pay our staff. And we want to have happy customers and have a name that, that, that stands for something we're proud of. But on top of that or after that, I'm not entirely sure anymore. I thought I knew. I thought it would be financial stability and a retirement that generates income for itself. But that has changed for sure. It's now more than that. It's not about money. It's not about recognition. It's about being really, really proud of what you've done and what you've created. And I'm not sure where that ends. I'm not sure yet. Um, one of the things for us, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned that I deem successful is when the school calls, I can go. I can go pick up my kids. I can do what they need done because I can boss myself. Um, so that, that to me, whenever that happens, I, I, I feel warm and fuzzy and I feel right. And I feel like all the work and the and the, the difficult parts, it's, it's all easy when that happens. Um, are you, go ahead, Jenna. Uh, well, from, I think last year was a big, we kind of came to a point where we were like, wow, what, is, what does this mean? What, for us, it was, to me, the success is providing something for a community that need, that has a need for what you're providing. So that that makes you feel successful. And then also having staff that depends on what you've created for for their financial stability. I would say that makes me feel successful, whether <laughs> whether it's my own personal financial stability or not. I don't I honestly that's very low on the priority list for me, but knowing that we are able to do something that our our crew can come in and, and you know, make a living or contribute to their household, I think that's pretty special. So to me, that is, that is where I have felt the most successful. <laughs> I, I think that success to me isn't something that can actually, I can throw a definition on quite honestly. Um, I do think that it will be ever evolving. And as you reach what you thought was success, it will change over time. Um, but I imagine it to be this idea that I can look back and feel really at peace and fulfilled with that with the idea that I've accomplished what I feel to be my purpose here um, and impacting other people along the way. But I don't know exactly what that'll look like. I'll let you know if I figure it out. Well, those are some very powerful answers. So I appreciate y'all being, um, I, I figured this wasn't gonna be one that had a set definition, but I wanted to hear what y'all had to say and I really enjoyed that. So um, I think we have two more questions left on our preloaded questions. So let's keep trucking. Um, what is your favorite aspect um, about being um, an entrepreneur? For me, I just love being a part of my town. You know, I, I've, 
uh, and dictating how I get to be a part of my town <laughs> a little bit. Um, I grew up in Woodstock. I've had three Woodstock addresses and been here my entire life and just to see it change and um, now know that I get to be a part of that change and a part of directing the change a little bit, but just seeing where it goes and uh, meeting people I would have never met otherwise who have been in my town, sometimes the same amount of time. Um, I think it's really special that we can, um, we, we can dictate our time and our schedule so that we can allow ourselves to be in town or be in our community at different times. I think my favorite part of being an entrepreneur is creative freedom. I've worked behind the scenes doing marketing and contributing to a lot of other people's businesses. Um, although I was, so to speak, an entrepreneur then with a small marketing agency working independently, it's much cooler to be on the other side of that where I can do that for myself and it's a public entity that other people can can enjoy um, and really being able to dive into that from every aspect. If there's something that I ideally want to do, it's not a matter of if, it's when. And knowing that I'm the driver in the seat that will make that happen is really awesome. I think my favorite part um, and one of the reasons why I did this when I did it um, is that I, you know, my background is with a corporate coffee house for 10 years in management. And I never felt like if I saw something that wasn't right for the employees or the customers or the quality of the product, or there was absolutely no power for me to do anything about it. And I think that um, that was magnified during COVID. The way things are handled and the way treat people are treated, employees, you know, it becomes a corporate legal issue rather than a personal issue. What is best for our town? What is best for our, our, our loyal customers? What is best for our employees? What is best for us and our families? And I think that was the big push, honestly. I know it's bizarre, but COVID was the big push for me to get out of corporate America, like get out of the corporate restaurant management, you know, the machine and just be able to say to my employees, I'm here to take care of you. And to say to my customers, we are here to support this community. We are here for you. What can we do for you? Rather than, you know, having some legal department off in, dare I say, Seattle, make those decisions for our community. And, you know, I mean, I just didn't feel like it was right. I didn't feel like it was right. And I didn't feel like it was okay. And I think that was honestly, COVID was honestly the big kick in the, in the rear that I needed to do something I've always wanted. And you know, and at least, at least now if, if, if it fails, it's on me. If it succeeds, it's on me and, and my staff, of course. And that's something really satisfying for me personally. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, I think that this is this event has been my favorite one to plan because of the community aspect that is surround that comes with working with local businesses, and um, it means so much that it's something that y'all that y'all care about when you are working on your business. Um, it's the same thing with with libraries. It's all about connecting with our people and the community and trying to meet needs. And so I love seeing that um, from the business side, how people can pull that passion for community and put it into whatever their personal talent is. So um, that's cool to see. I think this is our last question. Um, what has been the most satisfying moment um, or aspect um, in business? So something that maybe a memory or um, an event, what's been the most satisfying part for you? So for me, Mark's not on here, but Mark and I have always done every single thing together. That's my husband. So we uh, grew up together. Um, I've literally known him for my entire life and we grew up together and then dated in college and got married. And 
Um, he's the one right now holding the baby who's overtired and crying to pieces. So get yourself a good partner in life, whoever that is <laughs> to do, to help you support, you know, to help support you uh, being a parent and um, being in business. But uh, when Mark was able to leave his corporate job and come to work full time, what we were doing at the time, that was one of the most incredible things. And he's since done that. He's gone back to, you know, some um, contract jobs and back and forth. But um, for the past couple of years, he's been he's been totally with our businesses full time. And that was one of the most satisfying things to say, this is the future that we want to take our family in. And so now we're going to we're going to step out in that direction. Total leap of faith. No idea what's going to come of it. Both of your incomes are tied up into your entrepreneurial efforts. Um, and so to have uh, to have that be able to happen and, and let Mark be able to be home now and, and get to we wanted him to be a full time dad at home and me to be a full time mom, which is not really totally possible it's best of both worlds that you can't really have um but yeah so i'm super thankful to have a great partner and that's been one of the most that day was a good day we went and had mexican food and had a party and said that's it now we're full-time together so um so with that i'm gonna hop off and help him with bedtime so i'm sorry to run early care but thank you so no, much no thank you so much <laughs> families first <laughs> thank you <laughs> all right nice chat bye, y'all. thank you bye anna I can honestly say, I don't think I have one moment that's been most satisfying. Honestly, every day when we have customers walk in the door and we have happy, happy staff, I mean, that's just every day is satisfying. There's really not one moment because I think if you're, I mean, I guess if you're trying to reach a goal, like pay off a loan or get to that point, that's a really satisfying day. But I think every time that you you reach a goal like that, you probably have another one in, in your eyesight. So honestly, every day is satisfying in, in, in business ownership, to be quite honest. I think maybe so far, the, the opening the door, the first opening day was beyond, absolutely. But like Jenna just said, got the door open and about five minutes later I was like okay so what's the next goal you know I mean that's you know they're they're very short-lived little tiny satisfying moments and I think they add up over time you know and, and I think like I said the goals change what is satisfying now is like okay we did that so what are we going to do now you know and I, I just kind of keep, keep going forward I Um, I think a recent, it's probably not the most, but a recent satisfying moment, recent-ish, um, was when we were able to actually hang our sign, which was really exciting. So I don't know if you guys know, but when we started, we took over an existing concept as well. So we came in, we operated underneath them as, as Bizarre Coffee for a couple months while we transferred over all licensing, which allowed us to get in really quickly and you know start meeting the community. Um, what that meant was slow and steady changes and painting on the weekends and staying late and doing all of those things to evolve the place into something that we were really proud of. And as an artist, I could stand behind and be like, I had a hand in this. Um, and we had a sign printed for a while, just waiting for all licensing and everything. So when we hung it and our logo was, um, designed from a piece of my art. So it was really cool all around to see my artwork in this logo printed on a sign and then now hanging in front of a building. So that was probably a really, really, really cool moment. And it was awesome. Well, thank you for sharing those satisfying moments. Um, that's awesome. Um, I guess I think we're at we're at the point where we can field some questions from any of our attendees. Um, I do have a backup question in case no one has any questions, but I do want to give those who are in attendance today, if you have a question um, for any of our panelists, you're welcome to unmute and um, ask a question.
And you can also put it in chat if you don't have, I should have mentioned that too. If you don't want to talk, you can put it in chat as well. But while we're waiting for any other questions, I will present my backup question. Um, so if you had to give one piece of advice to someone who is at, you know, the very beginning, um, you know, of entrepreneurship, what is that, what is the piece of advice that you would give them? My piece of advice that I had to really learn the hard way um, is done is better than perfect. I honestly tr tell myself that probably five times a week because I tend to want to make everything perfect before actually doing it or releasing it. Um, so if there's something I can honestly say, done is better 